This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Writing radio scripts for a weekly series wasn't easy. Each script had to be turned in at least two days before airtime, as rehearsals were needed, corrections in the script had to be made, trimming or extending the time had to be determined, and most important, everything had to work, from script to actors to music to sound effects. The burden of delivering a finished, well-thought-out script was just as difficult then as it is now in television. Writing a weekly radio show that allowed the great detective to solve a murder in less than a half hour was quite a feat. I say less than a half hour because time was needed for the beginning introduction each week, the end credits, and the commercials. Thus, each radio drama actually ran 24 minutes in length. In the radio mystery you are about to hear, the Adventure of Maltree Abbey. I hope you recognize the actor who plays Lord Harold Carter. Well, let me tell you in advance. It's my good friend, the late Ben Wright. Ben came to America from England in 1947, and the role of Lord Carter may well have been his very first on American radio. Ben went on to play in hundreds of radio shows throughout those golden years, and little did he, or anyone else for that matter, realize he would one day portray Sherlock Holmes for the final 1949 season on American radio. And as a final touch to a long and wonderful career as a radio, television, and film actor, Ben was the co-host on our previous series of Sherlock Holmes radio cassettes. And now, Tom Conway and Nigel Bruce as Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in The Adventure of Moultrie Abbey. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Well, once again, it's time to keep that pleasantest of all doctor's appointments, our weekly visit with our excellent host and incomparable storyteller, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Ah, uh, there you are, Mr. Bell. Just in time to join me in a glass of port. The decanter's there on the sideboard. Help yourself and then settle down. Fine, Dr. Watson. I suppose you're already with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of Moultrie Abbey, isn't it? Yes, my boy, and in many ways, I'm inclined to think it was one of the most singular adventures that Sherlock Holmes and I ever had. But before I begin the weird adventure of Moultrie Abbey, haven't you, haven't you got a word for our listeners? Yes, Dr. Watson, I have. Men, neat-looking, well-groomed hair does so much to give a man that air of success, to say nothing of adding to his good looks. And I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing about this modern trend in hair grooming, which has become such a nationwide favorite. It's called Kremel Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Yes, that's exactly why Kremel gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look and keeps it in place longer, keeps every hair in perfect order from morning till night. Yet Kremel never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. Kremel keeps hair looking mighty handsome with a rich, healthy-looking luster, yet it always feels and looks so clean on your hair and scalp. Men... If you aren't already using a hair tonic, try Kremel. If you're using some other hair dressing, change to Kremel. Then see if your hair doesn't look better than it ever did before. Better groomed, better looking when you use Kremel. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the venerable bead and the adventure of Maltry Abbey? Well, Mr. Bell, that story began in Baker Street on the December afternoon many, many years ago. But shortly after tea, I remember, when Sherlock Holmes, who'd been pacing up and down our room, suddenly stopped at the window and looked intently out at the street below him. After a few moments, my curiosity overcame me and I joined my old friend. 
Looking over his shoulder, I saw that on the pavement opposite there stood a young woman dressed in the height of Edwardian fashion. She wore a fur boa and a broad-brimmed hat, from under which she nervous, hesitating fashion at our windows, while her body oscillated backward and forward. Suddenly, with a plunge like the swimmer who leaves the bank, she hurried across the road and we heard the clang of our front door bell. Hmm. Took her a long enough mind to time to, to make up her mind in whom? Yes, Watson. I've seen those symptoms before in women. Oscillation on the pavement generally means an affair du coeur. She would like advice, but is not sure whether the matter is not too delicate for communication. Oh, she looked a pretty little thing. Perhaps some scoundrels jilted her. Oh, no, Watson. In such a case, the usual symptom is a broken bell wire. Here, I think we may deduce the young lady is not so much uh, angry as uh, grieved or perplexed. Why not meet her at the head of the stairs, old chap? Mm -hmm. I know Mrs. Hudson's rheumatism is bothering her. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Of course I will. This way, young lady. It's all right. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Watson. Won't you come along in? Thank you, Dr. Watson. Uh, this is my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? I'm Sybil Carter, and I need your help, Mr. Holmes. Then please be seated, Miss Carter. I presume it is Miss, since I see no ring on your wedding finger. Yes, it's Miss. Though that awful man, Jonathan Davis, would like to make it Mrs. Oh, I can quite understand any man. Oh, quiet, Watson. Oh, sorry. It's, 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 oh, please tell me your problem, Miss Carter. Well, I can tell you in two words, gentlemen. Jonathan Devers wanted to marry me, and that was bad enough. But even to save the Maltry fortunes, I couldn't marry him. Now he wants Harold to leave the country and disappear. And when we think of the Abbey and the tenants, what can we do? I know that my brother's dead set against outside interference, but tonight is when we play the music. And if only you could be there. Well, that's, uh, that's considerably more than two words, Miss Carter. I'm afraid I can't make head or tail of any of them. Nor can I. But supposing you begin again and talk more slowly. Oh, <laughs> very well, Mr. Holmes. Uh, perhaps it'll be better if I ask questions. You mention your brother's title. May I ask what that title is? Uh, my brother's Harold Carter, the 14th Earl of Maltree, and the poorest. Confidentially, we're in a dreadful way financially. Harold invested in Canadian copper last year. The market dropped recently and we were nearly wiped out. That's when this awful Jonathan Devers came on the scene. And who is uh, Jonathan Devers? Oh, he's a cousin of ours from South Africa. He's a dreadful boar, but extremely wealthy. And he wants to marry you, sir? Yes, but even for the sake of the Abbey and the Maltry fortunes, I couldn't do that. Now he's offered Harold 50,000 pounds in cash if he'll go abroad and pretend to disappear. You see, Jonathan Devers is next of male kin in line for the inheritance. So Mr. Devers is trying to bribe your brother to disappear so that uh, he may inherit the title and estates? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Mm. In this particular matter, I fail to see how I can help you. Oh, but you can, Mr. Holmes. You see, the first Earl of Maltry, he was created by Henry VIII, you know, left a family motto. It's inscribed in our private chapel at the Abbey. It says... If the more trees be in need, seek the venerable Bede. Well, Bede or some fellow who works in the parish, isn't he? Bede, Watson, not Beadle. Oh, oh Bede. Bede. Yes, spelt B-E-D-E. -E. Oh, Bede. Mm. The venerable Bede, if I'm not mistaken, was an 8th century monk who is revered not only as a saint, but as the first great English historian. Yes, Mr. Holmes. We have a statue of him in the chapel. And then we have a family custom that... <laughs> I know this may sound silly to you. Oh, don't worry, Miss Carter. I'm aware that some of these old, crusted superstitions often conceal surprising truths. Pray continue. Well, it's been passed down in the family that if ever the Maltries were in trouble, they should play a bit peculiar piece of music which he composed. Piece of music? What, a, what an odd idea. Extremely interesting. And uh, you're planning to play the music tonight, you say? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Heaven alone knows the Maltries couldn't be in worse trouble than they are now. And I want you to be there. Only Harold doesn't. So I thought, if you'd be your violin, I could pretend that you would just come to hear the music. An excellent idea, Miss Carter. As I remember, Maltree Abbey is in Gloucestershire. Yes, Mr. Holmes, at Chipping Martin. And express leaves Paddington at 5.30. Perhaps we could travel together? Certainly. Mm, so it seems like a wild goose chase, Holmes. An eighth-century monk and strange music. Sounds like a lot of mumbo-jumbo to me. Where's your chivalry, Watson? In any case... Shall you recall the singular affair of the Musgrave ritual? There's no telling what these old family customs may portend. So be a good fellow and pack your bag. There's no time to be lost. I'll 
will just have time to show you the chapel before dinner, gentlemen. Thank you, Lord Carter. And uh, after dinner, I shall be happy to gratify your musical curiosity, Mr. Holmes. But you mustn't regard my sister's visit today too seriously. Sybil's an overly emotional girl. And quite frankly, I wish that she hadn't approached you. I feel that Moultrie Abbey is my duty. I'll find some way to save it. And my tenants. I uh, trust that the music will live up to its magical reputation. Well, this is the chapel. Mm, what a beautiful building. Must be very old. Oh, 16th century. The Abbey House was built nearly 100 years later. Uh, hold your lantern a little higher, Dr. Watson. Uh, that's it. Now, I, I want to show you a prized possession. There you are. Magnificent. Quite magnificent. This, I presume, is the statue of the Venerable Bede that uh, your sister spoke of. Yes. It's an excellent specimen of 16th century wood carving. Note particularly the delicate work on the beads of the rosary. Odd. Very odd indeed. What's odd, Holmes? The fact that the... Oh, it I have to tell you to keep away from me, you filthy scum. Don't you take your whip to me, sir. I, I'm, I'm not doing nothing. Oh, oh, what the devil's going on out there? Oh, come on. Come on, you little Take that. Oh, don't you lay your whip on me. Jonathan, what's the matter? I demand that you discharge this groom of yours. You can't whip me, Mr. Devers. I'll have your blood for this, I will. Well, what's he done, Jonathan? He's been following me. Twice day I bumped into him in the grounds. Not half an hour ago, I was taking a walk by the bottomless town, and I found him skulking behind me. Now I bump into him, sneaking after me here. I say, you must discharge him, Harry. He was only hired today. Ah, I suppose you're right. Wilson, you may collect a week's wages and leave in the morning. I wasn't doing no harm. Just trying to deliver a telegram. That's why I came here. It's one of you gents, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I am he. Then this telegram come for you. I was only trying to find you when this son of a South African oh, slave driver comes in. Oh, I'll have your blood, you see, if I don't. That's enough, Wilson. I clear off. I'm sorry, Jonathan. Oh, by the way, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Mr. Jonathan Devers. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Devers? Ah, yes. Sybil told me that you were having distinguished company at your musical soiree tonight. How are you, gentlemen? And excuse me. We'll see you at dinner, no doubt. Bully. That poor devil of the groom was half his size. Mr. Devers mentioned that he was walking by uh, the bottomless tarn half an hour ago. What, may I ask, is the bottomless tarn? Oh, it's a lake on the estate. It's just behind the gate, gamekeeper's cottage. Well, there's a legend of, that it's fathomless. All I know is that some years ago a prize heifer of mine was seen to fall in and drown. So we dragged the lake, but no grappling hooks we could obtain touched the bottom. Interesting. Holmes, uh, the telegram that fellow brought you. Oh, yes, the telegram. Uh, give me the lantern, Watson. Uh, uh, thanks. An extremely illuminating message. Read it for yourself, Lord Carter. Well, it says nothing but my cousin's name, Jonathan Devers. And yet the message is quite eloquent. It is an answer to a query I made before leaving London. Who forced that market drop in Canadian copper which wiped out the Maltree fortunes? You mean that Jonathan deliberately smashed me, Holmes? It would seem obvious. Yes, it's perfectly clear the Devers covets the title and stop at nothing to get it. Holmes, what am I going to do? What the devil am I going to do? We must wait until after dinner and hope that the musical composition may give us a solution to your unhappy problem. <laughs> Sipples played that rather dull piece of discordancy. I hope you're all satisfied. Naturally, the Maltree fortunes will be restored. Very funny, Jonathan. What do you make of it, Mr. Holmes? It's uh, curious. Very curious. Will you repeat that principal theme again, please, Miss Carter? Yes, of course. Thank you, Miss Carter. I think I begin to get a glimmering of the mistress, mysterious message. Yeah, best of I do. Sounds like a jumble of meaningless notes to Never me. Never mind, Dr. Watson. Your brilliant friend thinks that he saved the Maltry fortunes. In that case, Harold, I suppose you won't need to see Mr. Alexander in London tomorrow. Why, how did you know that? That your solicitor planned to start bankruptcy proceedings at the latest tomorrow? <laughs> I, too, have my investigators, Harold. 
They seem a bit more efficient than your great Sherlock Holmes. Good night, Sybil. Good night, gentlemen. <coughs> uh, there you are, then. What are you doing, listening at the door, you sulky swine? I was just going to the kitchen. Uh, get to the stables where you belong. I see that groom again, Harold. I'll break his neck. See that he goes tonight. How dare he speak to you like that, Harold? He's not master here. Not yet, Sybil. But I can't hold on to the place much longer, and he knows it. You thoroughly unpleasant scoundrel, you ask me. Mr. Holmes, you said the music gave you some clue to the message? It did, Miss Carter. But uh, it requires thought and a certain amount of uh, musical experimentation. I doubt if this music room would welcome the consumption of an ounce or two of shag tobacco. I think, therefore, that Watson and I will retire to our own room. With the aid of a pipe and my violin, I shall give the matter undivided attention. And tomorrow... Tomorrow... We... Moultrie Abbey will go into receivership. Not while Sherlock Holmes is on the case. Oh, thank you, Watson. A man of my uh, peculiar modesty needs your constant reassurance. Then why not go to sleep, my dear well, How can I when you keep scraping away that wretched fiddle? Da 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 are in need to seek the venerable bee. This music will solve the Moultrie's problems. You can't whip me, Mr. Devers. I'll have your blood for this, I will. Too bad that your solicitor is starting bankruptcy proceedings tomorrow. You must help us. You must. When the Moultrie is in need... Seek the venerable bee. I've got it. Watson, wake up, wake up. Uh, um, uh, what's the matter? Uh, what's up, Holmes? I've got the answer, Watson. I've solved the musical message. Before the night is through, I think we shall find the secret of Maltry Abbey. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and discover just what that secret is. Leading hair specialists in this country constantly advise us to take better care of the hair we've got. And men, don't forget that if you want your hair handsome and healthy looking, one of the first requirements is a hygienic scalp. And why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Kremel hair tonic? Kremel is a highly specialized hair tonic which gives you your money's worth. It contains a unique combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair preparation. It keeps hair attractively groomed at all times, looking so neat and orderly. But Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A Kremel massage stimulates circulation right in the surface of your scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. At the same time, Kremel removes dandruff flakes. And it's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer and more pliable. So men, take better care of the hair you've got. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kremel daily for better groomed hair for a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, I, I'm just as confused as I'm sure you must have been when Sherlock Holmes awakened you. What was the musical message? Supposing I tell you the story in its actual sequence, Mr. Bell. I quickly dressed, and in the moonlight, Holmes and I stealthily crept down the corridor to Lord Carter's room. A few moments later, the three of us, carrying lanterns, started down the staircase leading to the main hall. Holmes, as you went into Lord Carter's room, I'm sure... It's certain that I saw another door down the corridor, half open, 
and, and then closed. Which door was it? The last one on the right. Well, that's Jonathan Zither's room. Well, I suppose he knows that we're up to, which I must confess is more than I do. Well, if I'm right, not even Devers can stop us now. You're being confined in mysterious homes. Will you tell me why we're heading for the chapel at two in the morning? In a few moments, I shall make the reason extremely clear to you, I hope. Well, I hear the door. Look, 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 look. Through the stained glass windows over there. I swear there's someone with a lantern in the grounds outside. Our immediate problem is here, inside. Focus your lantern on the statue of the Venerable Bede Watson. That's where the answer to the mortuary legend lies, I think. For heaven's sake, Holmes, I wish you'd be more explicit. Very well. Let me see if I can whistle those notes written in the musical theme. The notes are B E D E B E A D. These notes were followed by a rhythmically repeated series of the note D four times. Surely now the pattern becomes clear. Well, the notes B E D E obviously stand for Bede, the Venerable Bede, and we're standing in front of a statue here now. But the second four notes are B E A D. You yourself pointed out the rosary on the Venerable Bede statue, Lord Carter. The notes B E A D must refer to the beads of the rosary. That's why I became suspicious on first seeing the statue. The rosary did not come into use till almost five centuries after the Venerable Bede. Yet, his statue had one. Then, what does the repetition of the note D four times mean after the melody? I think it gives us the vital clue. D is the fourth letter in the alphabet, and it's repeated four times. Let's see what happens when we press the fourth bead on the Venerable Bede's rosary. So, by George, I think you're on the right track, Holmes. You are. Look at that section of wall behind the front. It slid back. Come on. Let's see what it takes us to. There's a narrow stone staircase leading below. Well, I'll go first. Holmes, perhaps you have saved the Maltry fortunes after all. I hope so, Lord Carter. I hope so. Watch your head, Watson. Oh, must have built these steps for pigments. Holmes. Do you suppose we'll find any hidden treasure down here? I shall suppose nothing, Watson. In a few moments, there will be no need for conjecture. Holmes, I'm afraid we've drawn a blank. What's wrong, Lord Carter? Now look for yourself. Hmm. A deserted crypt? Nothing but a few cobwebby old relics. Yes. A crucifix, a Bible, a gutted candlestick on the table here. Oh, they may have some small intrinsic value, but nothing else. Oh, I was a fool to have any hopes. And I was expecting to find buried treasure. Wait a moment. Something, possibly the treasurer, has recently been removed from here. Well, what makes you say that, Holmes? The room is thick with dust. And yet there's a large rectangular space free from dust on the table. As though a heavy folio volume had recently been lying there. By George, you're right, Holmes. And look here on the floor. Fresh footprints. Yes, someone has recently anticipated our discovery. Well, it's not very hard to guess who that someone was. Jonathan Devers. Aha! Observe these curious marks on the floor by the table. Four round dots rectangularly spaced. I should say that a Gladstone bag has been placed here. A bag that was undoubtedly used to remove the treasure. But why, Holmes? Why carry off a heavy book in a bag? Supposing that book were of priceless value, Watson. Suppose it were the heirloom of the Mortar family, and its discovery by the rightful owner might save the estate. Yes. And I'm sure that Devers is quite capable of stealing it. The question is, though... What would he do with it? Precisely. And to answer that question, I shall try and imagine myself in the shoes of Mr. Devers. I am a millionaire, therefore I don't need the treasure. Too risky to sell it anyway. All I want to do is to keep it from the more trees, so I'll destroy it. But how? I have the time or the opportunity to burn it. Difficult with a heavy book in any case. So I'm looking for some place to dispose of it where it may never be recovered. The fathomless lake on this estate. That'd be the place, the bottomless tarn. Of course. Remember the devil told us earlier that he'd been walking by this evening? Then let's go there as fast as we can. I can only pray that we're not too late. Look, look, look. There, in the moonlight. It's Jonathan Devers. He's running towards the edge of the lake. Yes, and he's carrying a Gladstone bag. Which means that we can run faster than he can. You have your revolver, Watson? Yes, yes, I have. Don't hesitate to use it. This devil's work must be stopped. Come on, faster. Faster. Oh, we'll, we'll never catch him. He's at the edge of the tunnel. Drop that bag, Mr. Devers. You're too late, my friend. Drop it or I'll shoot. I'll drop it in the bottom of the town. There. <laughs> Goodbye to the treasure of the mulch. 
Kane. You get You've ruined me. I'll have the law on you for this. You're a common thief. I don't know how you'll prove it, Harold. There was my own Gladstone bag and I dropped it in the town. You don't even know what was inside it. But here comes the man who can tell us. You thought it's Wilson, the groom fellow you discharged, Lord Carter. Well, what are you doing here, Wilson? What's that book you're carrying? I just done what Mr. Sherlock Holmes told me to, sir. I was following Mr. Devers. When he put down the bag, I went off to get his coat before coming out here. I thought there might be something valuable in it. I took out this book and I filled the bag with a few rocks. Wilson, I'll No, you give won't, me. Devers. Or you'll end up in the town where you belong. Let me see the book, Wilson. Here you are, Governor. Thank you. Hold the lantern a little higher, Watson. That's it. Aha. These faded pages are written in monkish Latin of the 8th century, and the hand is of the same period. Unless all my researches on the datings of documents are valueless, these may be, they must be, the original manuscripts of the Venerable Bede himself. Good Lord, then they're absolutely priceless. And that means that the more trees are saved. And you, Mr. Devers, will have the privilege of inspecting the interior of an English prison. What charge could you make? Common theft. Burglary. The proof would depend on the word of that filthy groom there. And who's going to believe the oath of a servant with a grudge over the word of a South African millionaire? I think it's high time that this uh, filthy groom disclosed his true identity. All right, Mr. Holmes. The gentleman, I'm Inspector Athelney Jones of Scotland Yard. And a great credit to the force you've been, my dear Jones. Yes, indeed, you certainly have. Your impersonation of a country groom was masterly, quite masterly. And now, uh, let's return to the house, shall we? It's nearly three in the morning, and I think we've had enough excitement for one night. <laughs> Satisfactory case, Watson, don't you think? As we head back to London, I must confess to a certain glow of satisfaction. The fortunes of the Maltrees are restored, the villain foiled and in custody. And, uh, And Scotland Yard get the credit. You know that, of course, Holmes. Well, they deserve it. Anthony Jones is a very enterprising fellow. Yes, Watson, an immensely interesting case. You see, Maltry Abbey was, uh, from its name, one of the properties expropriated from the monks by Henry VIII, who created the earldom. Undoubtedly, the abbot had hidden the monastery's most valuable possession, the bead manuscript. Well, I suppose the first earl discovered the hiding place and left the book there as a future security for the Maltry family. Exactly. Leaving the cryptic verse as a clue. If the Maltrees be in need, seek the venerable bead. Yes, I, I see it all now. You know, Holmes, to me the whole case was worth it when I saw that girl's face light up as we told her the good news. I fear that I'm less impressionable, old chap. For me, my retrospective pleasure in this case lies in the fact that an irreplaceable treasure has been saved and uh, that a monk who died 12 centuries ago will have been responsible for restoring the fortunes of a fine old family. Yes, Watson, I think that in many ways you might refer to this as a uh, arm of successful case. Dr. Watson will be back in just a moment to tell you about next week's story. Ladies, you've heard it said that a woman's hair is her crowning glory, and how true this is. That's why you ladies should take the very best care of your hair, especially in shampooing. I'm glad you brought that point up, Mr. Bell, because many popular shampoos have a tendency to dry the hair. Well, here's one shampoo that will never dry the hair. Never under any circumstances. And it's Cremel Shampoo. Yes, Cremel Shampoo is simply wonderful. It actually glamour bays each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural, glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Cremel shampoo whips up a luxurious, active foam, even in the hardest water. You can use it as often as you wish, over a long period of time, and it'll never dry your hair. In fact... Cremel Shampoo has a built-in oil base, which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Remember, ladies, that Divinely Beautiful Powers models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves their hair more shining bright yet never dries the hair. Why not try it? K-R-E-M-L. 
Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I shall tell you how Holmes managed to trap a fiendish murderer who terrorized a pretty little English country village. I call it The Adventure of the Tolling Bell. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Case of Identity. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo, inviting you to be with us next week at the same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the tolling bell. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.